This is the Improved Photography Podcast, episode number 162. Hey everybody and welcome back to this episode of the Improved Photography Podcast. Today I am joined by my buddy Jeff Harmon down in Utah representing the hobbyist photographers of the, of the <laughs> yeah. world. And today we are ready to kick back and talk a little bit of photography, some of the things that we've been learning recently and also some of the news in the industry that's been uh, going on. But first, we want to start with a few questions from our listeners. We have an improved photography Facebook group. Um, a group means everybody can message each other. It's not like a page where it's just the page sending messages to you. So uh, you can find that at Improve Photo uh, Just go to Facebook and search Improve Photography Podcast, and uh, we'll find you there. There are just under 2,000 people in, in there, uh, and then the Improve Photography Facebook page has over 600,000. Crazy. All right, so the first question um, is about Linux and Ubuntu for photographers. And Jeff, this is like right up your alley, right? <laughs> so so let, me, let me give the... the introduction to those who may not be familiar with this stuff. So Linux is, well, it runs a lot of technology. In fact, uh, you probably use Linux every single day on lots of uh, on lots of things that you use, especially when you're using the internet. Uh, but most people are using Windows or, or the Mac for, for their computer. But there are other operating systems, and Linux is a very popular one, just not really with consumers. But some people don't want to pay for uh, for a Windows um, a Windows license to use Windows, or they just want to do things a little bit different. Some people use it for security. Some people like to use Linux instead. And one brand of that, one um, one type of that that's that's pretty popular is Ubuntu. It's totally free. You can download it uh, as an operating system and run it on just about any machine. And some people like to do that, especially on older computers if it's having trouble keeping up with Windows, something like that. And so the problem is, what do you do as a photographer if you want to use Linux um, on your computer? Are there any options out there for editing software? Because the normal software isn't going to work. What do you say, Jeff? Yeah. So, and actually, they, they don't call they call it either a flavor of Linux or a distribution um, okay. of Linux. Yeah. So that's what it is. And Ubuntu used to be one of my favorites, but uh, lately, Mint is the favorite I have. And it's, it's the hot new thing, huh? It is. It's the hot new thing. It really does a, a the best job I have seen of having good drivers available for your hardware, recognizing your peripherals, and has like a a, a pretty decent user experience. That's kind of been one of the reasons consumers haven't really enjoyed it. It's been too hard to get it set up and the UI is not so great, but Mint is is pretty exceptional. It's pretty good stuff. Anyway. So Lightroom and Photoshop, you can't get on no. if you're going to switch to Linux, right? That's and right. So that's the problem. That is the problem. And in particular, then, because you don't have those, it's how are you going to read raw files? That's kind of the basis of it. So... There's a very popular program that's been around for ages called GIMP, and it um, stands for the GNU Image Manipulation Tool. And uh, it doesn't read RAW files, so there's no native capability within GIMP. There's plugins you can add to GIMP. There's ways that you can do it, but it's really technical to figure out how to make it work so you can even read a RAW file and do anything with it. So you, you really take it for granted what Lightroom and Photoshop are doing for you <laughs> with all of the processing things that they're capable of and how easy it is to use it. And even other other commercial packages like uh, Capture One or, or other vendors that have these products, they do such a good job with it. It really makes you, um, you take for granted how it is when you get to Linux because you're really kind of stuck uh, there are a couple of them there, and and the questioner had added that on there about dark table, and raw therapy. So Those... dark table is basically a com not not a competitor even. It's a <laughs> it's similar to Lightroom. Yeah. Uh, in the functionality, it's the categorization. So GIMP is your close closest maybe to Photoshop, even though it's not really that close. Um, and dark table is your closest to Lightroom, but it's not really that close either. I've right. tried dark table and. It's a developer's product, right? So, like, <laughs> you look at it and it looks um, very antiquated. The 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 style of the program, the the UI, the way that it looks to you. The functionality is decent. It's fine. It's definitely designed to look as much like Lightroom as possible, but it just looks ugly and it's 
too complicated to use. And so it hasn't taken off for those reasons and the fact that it, it just doesn't have the, the functionality that Lightroom does. I don't think anybody could say with a straight face, Darktable is better than Lightroom. <laughs> no. It's not. No. It's not better. <laughs> um, but it's free and it's open source. And so there are there are there are there's promise for it absolutely uh, if this got some money if this got a little bit more effort maybe we, it could push lightroom a little bit forward but uh it's not there in the early days when i started um i went the route of gimp initially i knew it was out there i hadn't really spent a lot of time with it but i i've used linux a ton in my career as an it pro so um i tried it out thought it's free i'll go give it a shot and you can do a lot, but one of the big stumbling blocks that I came up against wasn't even just the raw files. This was when I was first starting. I didn't even shoot raw initially. I didn't know to do that. So I was shooting JPEGs. It imports those great. No problem. You can do a whole lot of editing with it. My problem was getting help, <laughs> finding tutorials. There are some GIMP tutorials out there, but the quality of them is just awful. You have it mimics the quality of the tool, I guess, and the help that you get. It's all free. It's all people just doing whatever they can to help. You didn't have any real paid options to figure out how to use GIMP. Um, I very quickly moved on because it just, there wasn't enough uh, help on how to use it and how to do things that I wanted to do with the photos. Yeah, and that is a real limitation when we're talking about some of the software options uh, or, or even technology. You know, you want to buy a new speed light one of the big questions is, you know, if, if you buy this weird flash that nobody else is using, are you going to find accessories that work, work with it? Are you going to find people that can teach you that? Um, it, you, you're often buying into different systems as you use different photography products, and, and this is no exception. All right, Anthony Fuchella asks, anybody savvy with audio and video with a DSLR? He basically wants to interview somebody and record it with a DSLR and isn't sure about the audio piece of it. Uh, and that's one that I can uh, that I can talk about a little bit. Um, audio is something that I have been forced to learn <laughs> because uh, of of this. Uh, now that now we're recording uh, the Improved Photography podcast, so I had to learn the pro audio stuff. And now we are doing it in video as well. And so uh, it's kind of forced me to learn a lot of the professional audio, which is uh, really difficult. Uh, it was a real learning curve for me to figure out the, the mics and the mixers and the, the audio recorders and everything. There really is a lot to learn. So what most people do, if you're using a DSLR and you want to just do audio, is you're just going to get a little shotgun mic. You're going to put it on, on the DSLR. You're going to plug it in uh, into the mic port on your DSLR, and you're set to go. Now, that's really simple to do. Um, and the audio quality is fine. And if that's what you need, then you're going to get fine audio quality. But the, the questioner, the person who asked this question, said he's specifically doing it uh, at a swim competition. And if you've ever been in inside a swimming area, uh, it's enclosed and the echo is just horrible. I mean, the sound is just terrible in a location like that. And so if you were to use a shotgun mic, indoors, especially in a swimming facility that always just has crazy echoes, uh, this is going to sound terrible. That's, that's a horrible place to try to be doing audio. It's just really tough. So if you can get outside, this is going to be a lot easier. But otherwise, I would go with something like a lavalier microphone. A lavalier microphone is the one that you see on the news. Uh, I watch Good Morning America every morning, and you can see the tiny little <laughs> black dot on the top of their collars, and that's the, the little microphone. Um, the advantage of a lavalier microphone is it puts it physically close to the person's mouth, and so it's easy to drown out any sounds around you. So the audio quality is the audio quality is always better. It's always more clear when the sound is closer to the mic. It's it's never a good thing if you're trying to record a sound from further and further away. There's just too much interference, too much stuff between you and the sound that's going to hurt it. 
So, um, so I would go with a lavalier microphone in this particular situation. Now there are two options you have for a lavalier microphone. The first is you can get a wired lavalier microphone, uh, just something with a 20 foot cord. It goes from the DSLR. You can just lay it on the ground and then goes up the person's shirt and then uh, will attach up uh, on their collar. And you can do something like, you know, 20 bucks. You can get a, a wired lavalier microphone, very inexpensive, easy to do, but the cord kind of gets in the way. Uh, it, it can be a problem. And so if you want to do something wireless, now the price has skyrocketed. Uh, you can choose the Sony UWP V6, which is pricey. It's <laughs> around $700. Uh, that's the microphone that I use most often when, uh, when I'm doing on-location tutorials. But um, it, it's just really good. The audio quality is excellent. It's uh, just really reliable, um, but it's super pricey. I tested for a company this week a Ceramonic wireless lavalier microphone. Uh, Ceramonic is a company that makes inexpensive electronics, and um, they they sent it out to me for for testing. Sent it to me for free, and um, but I am always free to you know tell people what I really think of it and. It was bad. <laughs> it wasn't good. Um, it's an $80 wireless microphone, and the range was about 10 yards. Uh, so, you know, if you are doing uh, interviews that are just 10 yards away, you know, it, it's actually a good option. It sounded great, but, but if you have any distance between the video camera and the person, this is not going to work. So there are a lot of a lot of hoops to jump through, a lot of things to think. If this is a just a one-off thing that you're doing, you're just going to do it this once. I would just get a wired lavalier microphone uh, for twenty-five dollars on Amazon. They sound pretty good. It's going to put the sound closer to the person. You should be able to uh, to do this just fine. I want to offer one more resource that they could go to if they wanted some more information. Um, have you do you know Dave Dugdale at all, Jim? Yes. So he, he does some really good focus on DSLR. Well, it was DSLR. He's now switched to mirrorless. But he's got some really good instruction out there. And he's done some real world testing too. He has lots of reviews of different products. So he'll have some other suggestions for you on some products that you can use, what he's tried out, what's worked, what hasn't, uh, video reviews, good stuff. You should go to, I think he's still at learningvideo.com. So go check that out and see if you know you can learn more information about that. Very cool. All right. The next question is from Kathy Page. Uh, why don't you take that one, Jeff? Okay. So this was out on our Photo Taco Facebook group, the other podcast in the one of the other podcasts in the Proof Photography Network. And she asked, I look at my meter for most shots to decide what exposure settings to use, like a lot of us do. <clears throat> and in a low light situation, my meter will require exposure settings with lower, ap lower aperture, slower shutter, high SO, all of the things that you need to do to try to get to um, expose the scene without flash. But her question really is, with a young Newell 563, which is one of the flashes that we highly recommend, how do you know what to set your exposure settings to because it's a manual flash? The, you don't have any TTL options, so the camera doesn't even know the flash is going to go off. How do you make it so that when the flash goes off, it doesn't completely blow out whatever's just in front of it and, and you cause a problem? So what do you think, Jim? What's your process there for, for addressing that? My process for addressing it is just take the picture. <laughs> That's just what I do too. Take the picture with the flash. <laughs> if it blows it out, the good news is we're not shooting film anymore. And so if it looks terrible, it's not a problem. Uh, if it's too bright, you know, everything's blown out. Easy fix. Just press the left button on that YN563, and it's going to take down the power of the flash. Right. And then take another picture, and you'll see, ha, ha, I did it. Or maybe it's a little bit too dim this time, and I've got to step it up. And that process can be done in, like, three seconds. Like, how long does it really take to just take a picture, look at it, too bright, and move it down? I think people are concerned when if you haven't used flash that, like, Ah, how am I going to do this? But I promise you, once you just get it and just test it, just try it out, I, I think you're going to see it's not nearly as hard uh, as you think it may be. Uh, all you're doing is just two buttons, more powerful, less, less powerful. And so it's really easy to adjust a flash. And over but time, I can understand. sorry, go ahead. Over time, you just kind of, you, you start to understand where to start at a little better, right? You, mm -hmm. you get used to 
the ambient light and how much is going to take to either overcome it or mix in with it well to, so you don't get blown out highlights on your subject you kind of get used to well i'm going to set my settings and then i'm going to set the flash to the power you get used to what you're going to do the, the one other thing i wanted to mention was if you want to make sure that your sky ends up looking good in the picture that's what i would set my exposure to i would set that first then you add the flash on your subject to the right power and that way your sky will be what you want it to be and your subject will be what you want it to be. That's kind of the balance that you want to get to. Yeah, that's right. And there are some tricky things to figure out the first few times that you do this. I mean, you go out and it's dim outside and you say, oh, I'm going to need a lot of flash power. And then you start to realize that, oh, now if I use a lot of flash power and it's dim outside, now the flash just kills all the ambient light. So there are a couple of things to learn. There's a little bit of a learning curve to this, but I want to be able to help you out. So Kathy, if you would email us, at jim at improvephotography.com. My assistant will send to you my lighting in a flash tutorial. Um, it's available on improvephotography.com for purchase, but since you asked and we used your question on, on the <laughs> show, I'd like to give it to you for free. Uh, and that really does walk you through everything you need to know to be competent with a flash. Uh, it follows, you, follows me on location on some of the shoots, and that's if you got the 2016 Lightroom Steel, the one that we did in um, on Black Friday this on, in 2015, then uh, you have it in there. It's part of the Lightroom steel. So go check your download uh, package and you'll see that it's uh, link is there that you can access it. I think a lot of people got that and I've got so many questions from people that say, hey, how do I, how do I get that tutorial? It's in there. Go check that download package. Uh, we spend a lot of time on that tutorial. So uh, it really should be helpful if, if that's what you're looking for. Well, this week I want to mention a little bit about the DJI Phantom. I've been talking about it a little bit the last couple episodes of the podcast. This is a very inexpensive, uh, in terms of drones, it's inexpensive, uh, <laughs> drone for photography. It costs uh, eh, between $800 and $1,200, depending on which package you're going to get of the DJI Phantom 3. But it's a it's a quadcopter that holds your holds your camera on it. Well, it has the camera built in on most of those models, and you can fly it around and take pictures. So I've been using it for real estate photography, and I, I I'm I'm torn on this device because it's an excellent excellent device in terms of uh, of the quadcopter itself. It's super responsive. It's easy to fly. Uh, I, I mean, I can stand. I showed my, took my brother-in-law out to the park. They were here visiting from Eastern Idaho, and I, I showed him how to do it. Showed him all the buttons and stuff. And two minutes later, after showing him just a couple tutorial and watch out for trees, just the basics, <laughs> like he was gone and he could totally fly it. And the first, you know, when you get one, I guarantee you're gonna crash three or four times, and then you realize, oh, okay, there are actual limit limits to what I should do with this thing. Um, you know, you're gonna make a few mistakes, but really anybody can pick one up and fly it. In fact, it even comes with a simulator so you can try out the controller and then watch on your iPad to see what the helicopter would do so you learn how to not crash. Like, it's pretty cool wh what it is, but in terms of the camera, <laughs> it's awful. It's really bad. It uses the exact same sensor as the, the GoPro Hero 4 and the, uh, what else? I can't remember. There's another popular camera that uses that exact same sensor. Uh, but so if you've used the GoPro, you know that like it's cool because it's tiny and it's cool because of the places you can put it. And it's cool because of the abuse ca it can take. It's not cool because of the image quality. The image quality is not that great. And the biggest thing that I've found is I'll take a picture and it looks coming out of the camera kind of similar to what I get out of my DSLR. The real problem is when I go to edit it and style it and make it look like I want one of my photos to look, it doesn't look so good anymore. Uh, so it's really the, the latitude and post-processing that it really breaks down. But a couple tips that I've learned this week after talking about that is that one, it's best to shoot in auto mode if you have a DJI Phantom. And one of the mistakes I was making was I was just bringing up the ISO too high. You know, mm. 400 ISO, 800 ISO is no big deal. Any camera can do that. I mean, just you can barely even notice the difference between 800 ISO and 100 ISO on, on most DSLRs. And so I thought, eh, four, 800 ISO, it's dim outside. This is fine. And I learned that that's really not okay. <laughs> uh, you really <laughs> want to keep that ISO very low, 100, 200. 
and then the image quality is significantly better. I mean, you push the sliders in Lightroom very far at all, and the photo just breaks apart. It's just weird artifacting yeah. and noise and all kinds of stuff. So I found the advantage of shooting in auto is that it's automatically going to take over some of the settings that are just different to set because you're on a drone and just use the uh, the uh, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank <laughs> the, the uh, exposure compensation that was so weird uh, just use the exposure compensation on the controller to make it brighter and darker because then it's going to use the shutter speed. I didn't realize, because I thought on a Phantom, I mean, it's vibrating, it's flying in the air. I would need my shutter speed, you know, over one, 1 over 100 all the time, and I found that that's really not the case. I can shoot down to 1 50th of a second if there's not a whole lot of wind, and it's totally sharp. And so, anyway, I'm, I'm learning a lot of different things about the, the Phantom, but one is shoot in auto, and the other thing is... I'm really hovering over that uh, that return button on my Amazon profile if I should return the Phantom and spring for the DJI Inspire 1. Have you seen this one, Jeff, the Inspire 1? No, I haven't really looked into them. Oh, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. You're going to regret it if you do because it is super expensive. Uh, you're going to spend about $4,000 to get it you know, reasonably <laughs> equipped. Uh, it, it's an amazing, amazing device, but it's really expensive. And the difference with the DJI um, Inspire 1 is that it uses a micro four-thirds sensor. Uh -huh. So the image quality is way better. It has intercha interchangeable lenses. I mean, the image quality is hugely different. And so you're buying a mirrorless camera with it, essentially. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. I yeah. mean, you're buying a micro four thirds camera with uh, the helicopter. The other cool thing about it is that it has uh, it, the camera itself is interchangeable. When a new camera comes out from DJI, you can take the camera off and put a new cam put the new model on, and you don't have to buy uh -huh. a whole new quadcopter. So that's really promising to me. There have been a ton of bugs with the DJI Inspire One that has turned off a lot of people who bought it uh, a little bit too early. Now version two came out last fall and it looks like reliability has, has gone way up. And so I, I'm just, I, I can't decide what to do if I should keep the Phantom and use it for a year or two and just get okay things with it. Um, you know, it's fine for basic real estate, but, uh, or if I should spring for the DJI Inspire One get the awesome image quality and something that I can use for years. The advantage of waiting is this technology is changing so fast. And since it's changing so fast, you don't want to buy the super expensive one now and then have it be grossly outdated a year and a half from now, two years from now. So that, that's kind of my thought process. What do you think, Jeff? So what about the uh, the painter's pole solution? Is, are you finding even with the lower image quality, you there are useful shots from the drone that that's helping you with the real estate? Yeah, in fact, I would say that the painter's pole option is better than the DJI Phantom for your for your average house. So the painter's pole that I'm talking about is you 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 buy literally a painter's pole from the from the, you know, home improvement store. You can buy a little adapter on B&H. I don't think there's one on Amazon. Uh, but you can buy it from B&H. Just search paint pole adapter on B&H and it'll come <laughs> up. And it basically has, a, it'll change it from a, a paint pole that, you know, is the weird screw on thing to the little socket that, that goes into a camera. And then you literally just attach your camera to the end of the painter's pole and then you hold it up and, you know, you, we're going up now five meters, you know, on a really long painter's pole. And that's an excellent height to be shooting a home from. When you do drone photography for the first time of real estate, I promise you're going to shoot too high. You're going to be up and it's, your photo is just going to be roof. Uh, you really want to just kind of get it at a medium height, much higher than a tripod, but a lot lower than you'd probably think. And so a paint pole really is a good option, and then you can use your serious good camera to be getting the picture. So I get a much better image uh, doing that, doing the paint pole, than I do the Phantom for that epic, perfect shot of the home. However, I have also been shooting a lot of land. I live in Idaho. There are a lot of acreage homes with, you know, a lot of land around them. And for that, you know, you don't want to just show the home. You want to show the whole property around it. 
Yeah. And for that, you know, you'd have to have some impressive paint pole to make this work, right? So for that, the, the DJI <laughs> Phantom or some kind of quadcopter is really just the right tool. And so I, I'm just torn what I should do if I should spring for the big one right now or if I should use the Phantom to get, you know, okay shots of the real estate and and uh, use the paint pole for the one epic shot. Do you think that realtors are excited that the like, uh, are you using that as a selling option right now about that you have a drone to be able to take the photos? Well, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm a little bit torn right now because I have my my application into the in into the FAA uh, to get the Section uh. 333 exemption, but and it has been 120 days, but I haven't heard back yet, and it's supposed to be 120 days that you hear back. Uh, so I need to follow up on that. I have done very little um, just kind of waiting for that. I want to make sure I'm following the law. Yeah. And so yeah. I, I've been holding back as much as possible. Uh, but it has been 120 days, so I'm not quite sure what to do there. All right. We want to take a second and thank one of the sponsors of this podcast, which is Zenfolio, uh, which is uh, on the podcast for the first time uh, this week. Uh, we really appreciate their support. So Zenfolio is an option for your photography website. Uh, and they do a lot of things really well. They've been vot voted number one by photographers for three years in a row uh, for, a, a, for your photography portfolio option. And our own Jeff Harmon uses Zenfolio. So what is it that you like about uh, Zenfolio, Jeff? Yeah, my favorite thing about it is the client interaction that it has built into it. I can communicate with my clients. I can send them the proofs that I want them to go through so they can pick their favorites that I'm going to work on. Uh, they can favor it right on the website. They can and then send it to me. Um, I can optionally allow them to download those and share them on Facebook. It will, if you don't do the um, watermarking inside of Lightroom, it has an option to add watermarking for you. There's just some really good things there that uh, that are client communication kinds of tools that that I really love to use. Um, I know. It's been pretty simple to be able to explain to my customers how to use it. They seem to really like it. Um, the one thing that they've added really recently within the last, I don't know, I think it's six, eight months, has been uh, a mobile app too. So that you can send them a link. You can create it just from the Zenfolio website. You go in there and you can create a link that you send, you email to your, your customer. And if they click on that link on their phone, it will tell them to download an app. And it's kind of a generic app. Um, but when they, after it gets done and they open up the app, it will take them to the shoot that you did for them. So you don't see, they don't see any of their client stuff. They don't have to drill down through, uh, different places to try to find where the photos are that you shot for them. It comes right up immediately. Really nice looking photos that are in the, it's a native app. It's not a browser based thing. It's a native application on both Android and iOS and the customers can even flip through the photos, uh, pick favorites there, again, if you want to use that for proofing. Or on the final delivery, it's a, good, a really great way to get them to share it on Instagram. Um, they can, right there from the, the mobile app, share it out to Instagram. And, and uh, it's, a, it's a good way for them to share the photos that you, you made for them. So the client interaction is what I really like about it. Yeah, I, I do like that about Zenfolio. If you, I mean, look at, at the interface, I mean, there's just a buy button right there. I'm looking yep. at your website right now, and boom, you can you can buy it. It makes it easy for those kind of transactions to happen. So that is pretty cool. If you're interested in testing out Zenfolio, you can start a free trial today with no credit card required. When you decide to sign up for Zenfolio, make sure to use offer code IMPROVE to get 30% off your subscription to show your support for the podcast. So that's 30% off Zenfolio by using offer code IMPROVE. Definitely at least go give it a try. Uh, you know, there are so many people who hang back, hang back, hang back and, and never get their website up. Like go test out Zenfolio and see if it's something that's that's gonna work for you. There are a lot of options out there and there are some real benefits to Zenfolio. It's powerful, it's beautiful, and it's been voted number one by photographers for three years in a row. And we thank them for supporting the Improved Photography Podcast. Well, Jeff, you wanted to talk a little bit about on this episode um, uh, about faking a studio. Tell me what that <laughs> means. What do you mean faking a studio? And you'll have a lot of input, Jim, here, because I know you've written some articles for the site that has 
along these same lines. Um, oh, Jeff, I have a lot of input about everything. Photography. <laughs> I, when somebody says photography, like when it's just like my wife and we're out with another couple, if if somebody in the other couple is interested in photography, the night's over. I'm just going to buy all night long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right, so yeah. tell me about. I hear you. Yeah. I do the same thing. We always start off with: is it Canon or Nikon? That determines uh, if we can be can friends we or be not. Friends? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we also heard a lot of feedback recently on the Facebook group that people want to hear more for hobbyist beginners. Some apparently weren't aware that I am a hobbyist, <laughs> which I'm not sure how that can be. I think I've made that yeah. pretty clear, but <laughs> I think you have too. And I I just read a review of the podcast. Uh, of somebody somebody said that they didn't like the show because they were listening and everything sounded good and then this one guy said he was doing a, a group photo and had to buy another flash to use a second flash and he's like these guys are fakes they're not <laughs> professionals it's like have you been listening to us yeah. you know that's the whole that's what you're here for jeff and what a lot of people love about you is that you're you're the hobbyist photographer you have a nine to five job you're you're learning this stuff and so it brings a totally different perspective to the show you know, I do photography full time. Nick does photography full time. Erica does f photography full time. Brian does photography part time. And so does Majid. Like we really kind of run the gamut. We have lots of different photographers in different situations. And we're now adding uh, more women and people from other countries just trying to get as much diversity of opinions and thoughts on photography as possible because it makes it interesting. And, and it uh, it it helps the listeners to be able to make their own choices about what, where they want to go with photography uh, by, by hearing the different options. So I hear you, Jeff. All right. So let me, let me go through kind of uh, the setup about how this happened over this last week. It's, it's a, uh, it's a little bit funny. Um, all right. So apparently there's this trend in Utah right now that for prom, for school dances, the groups are hiring a photographer to take pictures of them. I guess they're tired of the photos you get at the school that are, not very good. <laughs> they want to be able to control that. Anyway, they, they hire a photographer. So I had a, a group. It was five different girls. It, it was sweethearts. It was girls' choice dance. And the girls contacted me and said they'd love to have me be their photographer for this dance. And I'm, all right, that sounds fun. Let's, let's do it. So we made arrangements. I was going to meet them at a, a local reservoir here. It's really be beautiful surroundings right in the middle of the city. But it's, it's a nice little reservoir that they've got there. Uh, it, we were a little worried about the timing because the sun set at 6.30 p.m. that day, and they were – I was worried they weren't going to get there on time. But they said, okay, we'll be there at 5.30. That's great. It'll give us an hour. We can shoot there in those surroundings. And I brought everything that I had, flashes, gear, whatever I had, to just be ready for whatever because they, they didn't have any direction on what they were going for. I wanted to be flexible and do whatever they wanted. Well, we I got there at 5.30. Actually, I got there at 5 scouted out the location, tried to figure out what we were going to do, got some flashes set up in a place where I thought it would be good. We wait and wait and wait. <laughs> they never show. And finally at about six, one of the girls texts uh, my wife and says, oh, we're just barely picking up the last person right now. We'll be on our way. <laughs> the girls took a lot longer to get ready for the dance than they thought. Anyway. That's impossible. Yeah, the yeah. girls took longer than they thought to get ready. <laughs> yeah. This has never happened before. So – the light's gone. It, then we needed to be there at 5.30 to have a chance to really do anything. It was so dark, you really would lose all of the surroundings. And we could try to do some some uh, photos where you have like a black background, and that would be fine. But it was also very cold. The, the temperature dropped really, really fast when the sun went down. And these girls are in dresses that are their spring kind of <laughs> – they weren't dressed for warmth is the point. They were not excited at all about standing out there <laughs> to try to take photos. So we had to come up with another option. And, you know, we hadn't reserved a place. We didn't have anywhere to go indoors. So we thought, well, we'll go back to my house, which was not very far away, and see what we can do. And I don't have a studio set up in my house. I never have. I've never wanted to work that way. So I haven't ever done that. But I have gathered some of the gear over the last few years to make it so that I had a, a possibility here. Um, at one point, I found at a garage sale a really a collection of really big long muslins so those are backgrounds uh, clothy material kinds of things that you can hang up um, and use as a backdrop so that you can hide whatever else might be in your house like the doors and windows and shutters and all, all the stuff that's really distracting in a photo and makes it look unprofessional 
but I don't have a stand for it. I didn't have any clips for it to hang it up. I just purchased it a while ago thinking that someday it might be something I'd use, but I wasn't set up to do it. And we figured out what to do that, <laughs> that night real fast. So let me go through really quickly the gear I use because it's not expensive. In total, it's about $345 worth of gear, which may sound like a lot to some beginners and hobbyists, but really you can pay for that pretty quickly. One or two shoots, you're you're in the green or you're you're covered on that uh, expense. So really fast, you need your camera. Okay, so that's not part of the 345. You have your camera anyway if you're listening to this podcast. So <laughs> so you have your camera. And then you need either one, two, or three flashes. It depends on the size. Uh, I did some of this, a similar type of thing with my son a little, a couple of weeks ago, and I just used one flash and got this seamless white background effect that makes it look really neat. Uh, but if you get bigger groups, you're going to need two or probably three. I used three in this, in this particular case, and I'll explain how in a second. So the YN563 flashes are $65 a piece. Great flashes. You don't have to. You can make it work without it. But the YN560 TX controller that you put in a hot shoe of the camera is also something that is really helpful. Makes these things move along faster. Like the question we had earlier, talking about how you have to change the power on the flashes to get the right settings between the camera, the exposure settings, and the power of the flash. That that controller in the hot shoe makes it so that the off-camera changes that you need to make, you can do just stand and still right where you're at, and that's really helpful. So that's 40 bucks optional you don't need it um, the other thing would be silver umbrellas so that's really really helpful for pushing the light back onto the people in a way that makes it uh, bigger and not as harsh so you don't get really really harsh lighting on them uh, you can get two of those or sorry they're about 10 to 15 dollars a piece to get really cheap ones they're not going to last long if a windstorm comes up it's going to blow the umbrella apart <laughs> at that price but they're sufficient for doing something in a home studio, faking a home studio. Light stands, uh, you can get two of them for about 30 bucks that are nine feet tall. I wish they would go a little bit taller than that in some cases, but it, it worked, it, it worked okay. Then you need a flash and umbrella holder that goes on top of the light stand and they're about five bucks a piece. And then you get the, a white background. So if you went and bought a brand new muslin, didn't find it at a garage sale like I did, then it's about 40 bucks to get the same size that I had. So I used all that stuff, and here's how I set it up. You put the two silvers on either side with the flashes inside. I started off at full power. I wanted to overpower the ambient light in the room, and that worked out really well. And then the third one, I just stuck on the ground behind the group to flash onto the white background. And the whole goal of what I was doing was trying to get the white background to just disappear. I want to blow it out on purpose. I want to make it so that there really is no background because then you have a lot of options later in the in the post processing to deal with that but that's kind of the basic setup and then i uh, i take the photos into lightroom and the first thing you do is edit the people you don't worry about the background in there because that that really needs to be done in photoshop but do whatever editing you might need to do with the people if they, you want to raise the shadows a little lower the highlights change the vibrance whatever things you want to do inside of Lightroom on the foot for editing the people, you do that first. Then I, I take it into Photoshop. You do Command-E or Control-E, and it takes it into Photoshop. And you, um, <clears throat> you use the quick selection tool to select just the people. And that, that can be kind of tricky, but if you've done the back flash, the flash in the back of the group well, it really adds like a, a highlight ring around all the people. And that makes it much easier to quickly select out them, including like hair that's in the photo. You can really select out the, the hair easily. There's also a nice tool. If you've got the quick selection tool selected, there's a little button up at the top that says refine edge. And when you click that, if you just lightly trace around the hair with that, it really uh, does a good job of selecting just the hair and getting rid of the background from your selection. So it does. So 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 uh, why are why is it that you're having to cut the cut the people? Okay, off? so you're already shooting on a white background, right? Because it didn't get totally white. So ah, okay. So it, it, it's close, but there's still shadows. The thing was wrinkled like crazy. <laughs> it wasn't. Uh -huh. It was, and it's probably always going to be. It's hard to keep those things uh, not wrinkled. You could try to iron it, but that would take forever. So it was wrinkled like crazy. There's all these shadows that end up, even though the, the flash was there and I tried to overpower it, it still ended up with a lot. Plus, I 
it wasn't hung on anything straight. It was kind of draped across <laughs> the room. I used I actually used two by fours to, to lift it up, and uh, and so it it was draped, and that means there's lots of uh, I don't know as it's hanging. It's more like a curtain that way, and that there's just no way to overpower that background completely with the flash. There's going to be shadows, so it's going to be distracting. So you could try to cut out just the pieces that are there, but I found it just better. For me, I liked uh, cutting the people out and then put them on a background of whatever I wanted. It doesn't even have to be white at that point. It can be any color. It can be a, a nice digital backdrop kind of thing. Um, I found lots of free ones online for that. It, it really made it so I had a lot of options at that point to be able to do with it however I wanted. So cut them out uh, and then you, you make a mask out of your selection and drop your background behind it so that the mask only shows the people. The cool thing about then the mask there and and having that be um, how you control the background was if your selection isn't quite right, if if maybe an edge looks too sharp and makes it look like you cut it out or your quick selection tool missed some of the person and you need to paint it back in, it's really easy to go change your mask and, and fix it so that it looks right. So anyway, that's what I did and uh, I think it worked out really well. The girls were so happy and when they got the photos, um, they compared it to the dance photos that they that were people got at the dance. They were awful. <laughs> they were they were really bad. There was no flash. There was probably some kids that had a camera and were taking pictures for you at the dance. And uh, they were really really happy they hired us to do it. So, really quick way to to try to handle uh, faking that you have a home studio. <laughs> well, very cool. It sounds like you had a successful shoot. I saw some of the photos from it. it looks great. Yeah. Well, uh, in every episode, we'd like to leave you with a doodad of the week, some kind of product uh, that we like, a product or resource. And uh, Jeff, what do you have for us this week? So I really like the, uh, I don't know how you say it, Oxy LED or Oxy LED <laughs> product. It's the Q6 Bright Portable LED. And what I like about this, I used it just this week. We had a family event and... Uh, we wanted to take some pictures at the family event. It was indoors, very, very poorly lit, uh, opened every window and, and tried to get light in there. It just wasn't enough light. So my wife followed me around at this family event um, and just had this continuous light on. And she just kind of held it in position. And that way, I didn't have to wait for flashes to cycle. I didn't have to wait to uh, get the flash in the right spot or anything. It was really nice to just have it there. And I could fire away with my photos. And it was less intrusive. People didn't see this massive flash going off and drawing attention to it. So I was able to get more candid kind of shots with it. So I really like it. It's a, it's a continuous light option. Very cool. Uh, it's only $18. Very good. Well, my recommendation for this week is the Pelican um, SD card case. So I'm a tightwad. I really <laughs> 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 I hate spending money uh, on on things unless it's like cool gear, like a drone. Like that's cool. That's money, money well spent as far as I'm concerned. Uh, but on like the little things, I always try to save money. And so I, I got a whole bunch of mini SD cards. Those or sorry, micro SD. You know these those two super tiny thumbnail pinky size. Uh, uh, cards because I'm using them in the DJI Phantom. And I, I got several of them, and I thought, oh, you know, they, they didn't fit in my current card wallet. And I thought, eh, that's right. I'll just put them, like, in a plastic bag or something. I don't <laughs> want to spend $20 on a card wallet. And promptly, within the first week, I lost one of the little micro SD cards. And I thought, okay, I've now just lost $40 because I didn't want to spend 20 That was not a good deal. <laughs> right. um, and so this Pelican SD card wallet is uh, something that I, I would recommend. It's just a little case. It's waterproof. I don't know why you're ever going to soak your, your cards in water, uh, but it's it's waterproof. It's really tough. It fits a whole bunch of SD cards. It fits 12 SD um, and six micro SD and six mini SD cards. Uh, so it, really nice for whatever kind of SD card you're using. Uh, the Pelican SD card case is what I'm using. Yep, well, I have that, that one too. Oh, do you? Ah, yeah. See, you were smarter than me. You didn't have to learn the hard way, I bet. <laughs> All right. Thank you for joining us this week in, on the Improved Photography Podcast. We really appreciate your support, and we look forward to talking to you in another seven days. <laughs>